Kiddisly Gun Lock, Eric Mark here with you guys. I'm calling it, I'm dubbing it a preview bonanza episode because we got not one set, but two sets of grand finals in the LCK and the LCS. And again, I'm going to meme it one more time. The LEC is not over. It's actually back. We got a whole new tournament to play. Oh, man. League of Legends feast coming around for this weekend for you folks. Getting into a very juicy time of year as we continue our path towards Worlds. Getting some more things finaled out. Finals, of course. And yes, the LEC back in action and a necessary return to action to start proving to us that these teams can do some damage at Worlds. We're going to have... You know, all these teams qualified from all the major regions and have maybe one team from the LEC that's actually qualified. But we'll start with the big boys, the finals weekends. We got a pair of rematches in both the LCK and the LCS. We got to start with the Telecom War, fresh off a Game 5 loss. KT gets bumped to losers and then proves immediately against Hanwha. We got no business being in the losers bracket. Let's get us right back to that top three ah kt t1 you know on paper everything you saw in the regular season it should have been kt stomping their way through that first matchup but best of five t1 was and remains activated best of five t1 shows up faker is in the lineup and he makes the difference he returns t1 to the power level that is able to compete with a kt rolster and it all comes down to in this game five an incredible play from Kyria to make sure that it is T1 getting those advantages and finding that power to push on through and take the series at the end of the day. But it's that big play that makes that difference. That is that one that tips the scales enough for T1 to come away with this victory. One play is not enough for me to say that I am feeling extremely confident in a T1 heading back into this rematch that they can get a similar result against this KT roster because I think you better believe after being eliminated in that fashion by your rival, longtime rival in T1 and going down into that loser's bracket and performing the way that you did, this is a KT roster that is primed to make that trip and return back to the finals. And I was wondering, I was worried about what the mental effect would have been on KT losing that, as you highlighted, incredibly close to series to T1 again. But they saw all they had to do if I was the coach, I would have showed them VODs from the regular season. I would have said, look at you guys, you're annihilating everybody. And then they looked so angry against Hanwha Life, genuinely felt bad for them getting stomped in that series. But yeah, I feel like KT's going to bounce back. This feels like it's their time to really show up in this playoff push. I'm looking right in the jungle in this matchup. I think the biggest thing is, are we getting KT cuz or a little fall back into T1 cuz? And even more importantly, because cuz has been so good this split, we need owner to step up again if they want any business win in this series. You best believe that jungle matchup is going to be a prime location for this matchup. What we're seeing from these two teams, as you highlighted, Cuz is that engine that keeps everything operating at an incredible speed for KT Rolster when it's operating. And it's been operating quite a lot, this split, but it ran into some troubles in that T1 series. And a large part of that was owners stepping up and delivering that type of play that we have seen from him over the last couple of years. The play where he is the one supporting Faker, finding ways to get advantages unlocked for Zeus in that top side and feeding some kills over into the bottom lane for Guma and Kyria, even if they're already getting kills in the 2v2, 2v1. That is the very best when you're looking for this team from owner. This is going to be a great matchup in the jungle. Other matchup you can talk about is mid lane because last series, despite losing... BDD was winning the laning phase against Faker even in some of these losses. He's getting solo kills in some of these matchups. Not only did he hold his own, he got the better of Faker. Again, you know, in team fights, Faker was still fantastic, of course. But BDD, I'm sure, feels like he's the forgotten about OG godfather mid laner of the four because Chobi, Showmaker, Faker been stealing all the headlines for the last three years. But this is looking like 2018 levels of performance for BDD. And really for me, kind of one of the things that I am seeing with players like BDD, like Chovy, 
is they have an a, you know a pocket aggressive pick in the meta that they're going to they're able to switch off of something a little bit more stable or controlling in the mid lane bring that aggressiveness that power that engage bakers yeah there's a couple of those but it's a lot of the very similar corky azir we're seeing a ton of that i want to see a little bit more push a little bit more experimentation from the leader of t1 himself we need some leblanc out of him in this mid lane throughout this series one of those iconic picks i think it's going five again but i i just feel like this kt mentally and their read on the meta is at a different level and they're too good to not make finals even with t1 as a hurdle now the analyst side of me is saying i don't even think that we're getting to five games in this series i think it is kt pushing on that power i think they figure it out they solve the t1 rubik's cube on their second attempt and push their way into finals in a four game si series the fan side of me for t1 is looking at that optimistically thinking that yes again bring on the silver scrapes faker is going to come up clutch they're going to get it done the key thing for me is this the t1 that loses to gen g and is dwelling on those mistakes, on that loss, that missed opportunity. Oh, looking at everything else, all the other failures, the times they've come up short. Or is this the T1 with Faker that says, you know what? Pick ourselves back up. We've got this chance against KT. Let's show them how T1 plays League of Legends. I got a game five and I got KT stomping that game five. Things finally click for them and it's them heading back to the finals. Question is, KT or T1? Do either of them, do you like in the Gen G matchup? Do you like one of them more than the other? I think either way, Gen G should be the favorite. I think regardless, Gen G is going to be the favorite and I think a deserved one with that performance against T1 in that upper bracket finals to make sure they're in the, of course, big final at the end of it. When you're thinking about T1 and KT and anything that they could gain, you know, being competitive against each other and then the winner going on, you're still thinking about Gen G. You're still thinking about Pays dishing out all that damage. You're thinking about Chovy controlling that mid lane. Maybe that Yone's popping up. Oh, that's scary. Got to ban that one out. And of course, that's even before we start talking about the other aspects of Gen G that get it popping off. Doran being that steady island in the top side. Peanut turning back time and looking more like the Peanut of old, making a couple of plays. But sometimes with that veteran mindset and sometimes not because that's you know, that's Peanut. But Gen G is that favorite at the top of the LCK. Peanut guaranteed to have an amazing Baron steal in a series and losing an objective that he has absolutely no business losing. Seems to always uh, be the case with him. But yeah, he's in fine form in this heavily tank-centered meta in the jungle. LCS, not to be outdone, but they will be outdone by the LCK <laughs> finals over the weekend. That's my least bold prediction heading into it. But we do start... Uh, that loser's final with a rematch, just like the LCK. You got NRG versus TL, who met up in that first round opener of the playoffs. Uh, it was NRG coming away with that win pretty convincingly, but I will say that was a very different looking Team Liquid. They really leveled up during this loser's run. I don't think that it had it really occurred to Team Liquid. It kind of felt like, you know, that false start, false non start where someone else gets going type of thing. Team Liquid never had it going in that series. And I'm looking at what has happened since then. Team Liquid's got it going on. They've got APA popping up. They got Piosik looking like the world champion. Piosik out there on the rift. And of course, you sprinkle in some damage from Yon and Mr. Summit popping off in the top side. All good things that equate to a great matchup against NRG because, yes, even if NRG falls down into this position, you still got to be liking what you have seen from this team in playoffs and how I think they're leveling up and rounding into form at the toughest time of year. And yes, they maybe didn't show up in a big way against Cloud9 in that winner's final. My eyes are drawn because it's a domestic matchup, APA versus Palafox as the matchup I'm maybe most excited for, but I think most impactful for this series is going to be in the top lane because we know Summit stomps lane time and time again, often gets a lot of attention from Piosik, and Dokla did not have a great last series against Fudge, so we need big Dokes to show up, otherwise Summit is going to steamroll this entire series over. It's kind of a really key part for NRG to have 
Dokes, be big Dokes up in that top side, being able to be that force, that presence that dictates the way that you play, you position around these objectives later on because you've got that bully there in what he is doing in that from that top side and spreading it out elsewhere. Big Dokes, got to show up big in this matchup against Summit because Summit is eating good right now in these playoffs. This is the Summit that is of that level of MVP caliber Summit in the top lane. So you better have an answer if you are NRG. And whether that's Big Dokes or if it's calling up El Contracto to get up there and make sure some action has happened for the Dokes, you got to get it done. And for any hope of a deeper run, Piosik needs some help because he was dragging bodies in that last series against Golden Guardians through even some of the games that they lost. He was trying his absolute best. If you pivot to the bot lane, this is this is an opportunity for both of these bot lanes, especially the marksman when you're talking FBI versus Yon. Because honestly, I need to see some, some solid performances out of both of these guys so that I'm not incredibly worried about them matching up internationally against other bot lanes. It's tough because what we just saw at MSI, of course, of how Berserker was handled from these other teams, knowing that Berserker is absolutely kind of head and shoulders above a lot of the others as our best option in the LCS. You want to see this because you know that a player like FBI can hold his own, can compete on the international stage when he's playing at his very best. We've seen that with the 100 Thieves. You do need to now prove it again with NRG this time around in this run. And when you're looking at Jan, it's that step up. It is this crucial time of year where not only is your job always important to have that damage and be consistent, all these things, even more so right now in this deep type of deep playoff push, it's important for him. It's important for him individually because of how core JJ roams and how important he is to get other things unlocked on the map for Team Liquid. He needs to be steady on his own. And I think the only, well, the main issue with Jan is he's, to his credit, being more aggressive as of late, and you love to see that, but there's been a few moments where he's flashing in 1v4, the classic bad side of the coin when you're talking about somebody like Jackie Love, who sometimes does that. Now, don't worry, I'm not pairing, comparing Jan to Jackie Love, everyone. Just deep breaths, deep breaths. He's not quite <laughs> at Dra that level. Draven's nowhere close to that type of level, but that's okay because it doesn't need to be at this type of point for you. It's Jan. just the LCS. You got to win the LCS. That's all. It's got to win the LCS. I think this is just one where I'm looking at this player and I think that he has the talent. He has that potential still to take these steps. And this is one of those situations, as you mentioned, flashing in sometimes a bit too much in these aggression to try and get these kills, find that pop off, play on that edge for someone that hasn't always played on that edge that doesn't innately play like a Jackie Love type of style, it will take some figuring out, finding where that line is and how you're comfortable you are to pushing up against that line and possibly over it at times. I'm a bit worried the big NRG win against Golden Guardians was actually more a statement on the power level of GG heading into uh, this playoff run, which makes me really want to side with Team Liquid in this matchup and especially with how NRG performed against Cloud9. I feel like Team Liquid have a better chance of matching up against Cloud9 in those finals, especially if we get some more regular season level performances out of APA. I think for me at the very least, now at this time of year and you're starting to think about what this means for the world's qualification spots and how that shakes up, I think if you're North America, you want Team Liquid to hit their very best stride to unlock that ultimate potential that has been waiting for this team all year round and now has finally come into view just, just faintly in the distance with APA in the mid lane for this team. Things could be that type of way. On the flip side, if you want to go ultra proud NA dominance, you want to be NA hopium copium the extremes, Let's go NRG. Let's find big dokes and our domestic players popping off for this NRG squad. And listen, the reality is, I think last year we did the math. There was like three domestic NA players that were sent to the World Championship. You're getting already three with NRG, APA, and Yawn. You're already at five. Mr. Blabber at six. And Golden Guardians have it. You're almost getting double-digit NA residents representing. Wow. Ooh, this feels good. Finally, some good NA talent rolling on through. I think this is a good statement about what the scene is and kind of 
this underlying fact that a lot of people are ignoring about imports and everything else and all this hate on the LCS that you know what? If you actually look in and you buy in on some of these players in the North American system, you can get it done. You can build up power in this region, in these teams. And I think you can see that with this type of change and seeing more domestic talent flood in. Yeah, part of that is due to the contracts and the finances and all this other stuff. I don't care. Give me this situation. We are, we are sending more NA players to Worlds than we have before. Good stuff. And C9, you know, still Blabber, really the only actual domestic player. They're going to be big favorites against either one of these squads, of course. But it's got to be better for the LCS heading into this international event if either Team Liquid or NRG beats Cloud9, right? I think so. I think overall, having them be able to level up outweighs any little bit of negative that you would go from Cloud9 kind of slipping from that type of performance or that type of level. I think it would outweigh it. Having that benefit, having that boost to look at an NRG, look at a Team Liquid and go, oh my goodness, what they did this weekend? Those two wins, getting that one against obviously the other in this back. And then Cloud9, yes, that would be that boost up. That would be that type of level that I'm looking for for a Team Liquid to unlock and push in, have confidence in them heading towards a world championship. But at the moment, they'll need to level up because I don't have confidence in either of these squads <laughs> taking down Cloud9 in those grand finals. I don't blame you if you forgot and you were looking up, which teams are going to Worlds again for the LEC? We don't know. Nobody's clinched yet because we have the season finals kicking off this weekend. It's a six-team race and... Even G2, who have won two out of the three splits, have not qualified. It's top three uh, are automatically going. And then, of course, the fourth seed will play against Golden Guardians. But the winner's side, the top four, you got G2 versus BDS and then Excel versus Mad Lions. I believe the winner of that will automatically clinch uh, one of these top three positions to go to the World Championship. I think we're both pretty confident in saying G2 will be one of the four teams and would be absolutely shocked. I think they'd have to lose like three straight series, basically, or uh, I guess just two. But outside of that, the field's wide open in the LEC. Well, G2 would have had to forgot how to plug in their mouse and keyboards over the last couple of weeks, which, yeah, it's been a lot of weeks, maybe. I don't know. They'd have to lose to SK after losing to BDS, which... It would be a big-time collapse for them to miss out on this opportunity to go to Worlds. I think it's very much safe for this G2 team, especially... When you're looking at these teams that are there for the LEC, the one team that is standing out is the team that you did impress, did have confidence in, is G2. Because you better believe in Yike in the jungle, Caps in the mid lane, and what Hansama is dishing out for damage in that bottom lane. Yes, of course, Broken Blade and Mickey are very important parts of the team as well, but those are my three key pillars that get it going and keep it stable for G2 at the top of the LEC. The rest of the teams, it really feels like it's it's the classic, what have you done for me lately? Because Excel and Fnatic heading into the summer split, obviously you felt very bad about, but recently those were the other two teams making up the top three. They looked the best, honestly. Obviously Fnatic has the more difficult road going through the loser's bracket, but even in an Excel versus Mad Lions matchup, Mad Lions haven't looked good for six weeks, really. So I feel like Excel might be able to clinch another world spot before them. It's strange because you're looking at those teams, Excel Fanatic, in those type of positions where they are in this, uh, you know, grand finals. And you're saying, yeah, I, I would rather think that we would send them and be more confident in them, given the strides that you saw them take in this summer split, recent type of performance. And that is contrasted by looking at teams like BDS, SK, as you said, that you look at them and you say, what have you done for me lately? Nothing that's really impressed. And that is the problem when you're looking at this type of thing. Having this type of break between the, the splits and the LEC, you hope, you know, enough time to focus up or turn it around, reset, whatever, for a lot of these teams that are on the outside looking in compared to the success of G2 and then the success of Excel and Fnatic, a little lower down on that list this summer split. For me, SK has the least likely chance of making it to worlds uh I, I feel like you know the power level what you saw of them for the whole split it's more they're here because of what they did earlier in the year i don't have the confidence in them getting up to the level necessary they're already in losers 
Fnatic, I really want to say, is in the best form to actually make it right there with Excel. But you saw in the summer playoffs how important having a winner's side being able to drop a series was because they flipped a switch after they lost. Don't have that luxury here. So now I'm putting faith in the mental of this Fnatic roster, and I, that's a little scary for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, look, I love to make some hopium and some bold type of uh, prediction type of things. I don't know if I can go that far with Fnatic at this point. It certainly is one where you want them to have, you know, a little bit of that feeling of your feet to the fire, that understanding that this is it. This is the only chance you got. You got to execute and make sure you're getting it done. And I think that is a lot of pressure for this Fnatic team that did underwhelm for a lot of parts of the year, find their form throughout the summer split. And then the other big part of that finding their form in the summer split is obviously the, the maturation and kind of additional experience of us to the top side. And then what Noah has been able to bring to that bottom lane. The biggest question is, will this three week gap gap kill any momentum the teams had from playoffs if you have if this started a week after i'd feel even more confident in Fnatic and excel representing at worlds but a three-week gap might be enough time for mad lions to kind of figure some things out bds is maybe the team alongside g2 that i would be most excited to see on the international stage so because of that i'm picking them to bounce back even though they're in losers but I feel like it's XL and maybe Mad Lions not getting things to, or not, sorry, not XL. SK, as I said, and Mad Lions that are going to be on the outside looking in, unless three weeks was enough to completely change everything for Mad. I got to see some big kills. I got to see some pop buffs. I got to see, I'm putting the team on my back level performances from most of the LEC at this point to generate that hype that has escaped. Since the summer finals that we had go through for the LEC, this type of break is absolutely something that we are going to be looking at in the future when we're talking about this new uh, you know, scheduling format for the LEC. And there's an understanding to have some break, have some rest, or, you know, avoid burnout for the players and how to manage that in a system that is working this type of way. Absolutely, there are things to work on and manage in this type of thing right now. The outside perspective, everybody else looking into the LEC, everybody else performing, impressing during playoffs, the gauntlet settling, who's going to be in there for their world spots. The LEC is just lagging behind and you're poking it with a stick asking, do something. And they haven't done anything for three weeks until this weekend. And you're also poking everyone not named G2 and saying, do something impressive because I, I want to see, I want to be hyped about some teams from Europe heading to worlds that are not named G2. And right now I'm not at that point. Yeah. yeah. Hey, look, I want to sell you on some European league of legends. I'm busting through the door with Yike and his champion pool and what he's done. And I'm serving you up a side order of caps and claps and what they've got going on. And here are the axes from Don Sama's Draven to cut up whatever you've got in front of you. And then you go, yeah, but I want something that's not, G2. Give me something else. I don't got anything for you right now. Come on, LEC. I'm G2 Give intolerant. I can't eat any of this. <laughs> Give me the supplies, LEC. Give us some good games. Give us these performances to build up from these three weeks. Make us impressed and excited for LEC at Worlds. BDS going to lose to G2, but they're going on a miracle run through losers to qualify. You heard it here first, but that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.